Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our webinar today, the presentation which is on uh, employee stock ownership uh, plans. My name is Nicholas Goods, co-founder of SuccessionLink. For those of you not familiar with the SuccessionLink platform, uh, we're an online networking and communication platform designed to uh, and built for financial professionals for purposes of buying, selling, merging, and finding uh, continuity and succession opportunities for their businesses. The platform was um, launched in 2013, and um, we roughly have about 20,000 professionals uh, currently on the platform today, which represents uh, about 146,000 engagements uh, on the platform. Most recently, we introduced uh, insurance agents and CPAs uh, into the platform now allowing uh, the three different uh, financial professionals, financial advisors, insurance agents, and CPAs to all network and communicate with one another. So it's a pretty exciting time for Succession Link. A lot of great uh, feedback from our users, and we look forward to continuing uh, building some more features for our audience and for our members. So we thank you for, for your participation in the community, and we look forward to continuing providing uh, resources for you to engage uh, in all that we do on the platform. So today I'd like to hand it over to uh, Xander Heinen, who is co-founder at Alliance Partners Group, and uh, he'll kick off uh, the presentation. Thanks, Nick. Hi, my name is Xander Heinen. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the Alliance Partners Group. I want to thank Succession Link for this opportunity today. Uh, we also want to thank all the attendees for taking time to be a part of this informative discussion today. Uh, we hope you gain a better understanding of the topic from this time together. A little bit about who the Alliance Partner, Partners Group is. We are a group of professionals with a variety of different backgrounds who specialize in the area of subchapter S ESOP implementation throughout the United States. We are focused on providing the maximum benefit of a subchapter S ESOP via our proprietary modeling program that we develop for each client from their business's unique data set. We are pleased to have with us today two of our legal partners, Ron Whitney, from Honigman, Miller, Schwartz & Cohn. Ron is a part of the business group and is standing in today for, for Roger Cook, who is traveling outside the country. In addition, we are pleased to have Alex Mounts from Craig & DeVault to help us walk through an intro to the S-ESOPs and what an S-ESOP can potentially do for you and your clients. Thanks again for your time and interest, and now I'm passing it over to you, Ron. Thank you, Xander. Good afternoon, everyone. As Xander said, my name is Ron Whitney. I'm a corporate partner in the Honigman Law Firm. I'm standing in for my partner, Roger Cook, who is currently traveling in Europe and is unable to be here. Roger's an expert in the ESOP and tax matters with over 30 years of experience assisting clients with their business concerns, especially business organization and estate planning matters. I'm a partner in the corporate department and regularly work closely with Roger on the corporate and transactional side of business conversion, sales, or other dispositions. Often we may be involved in the sale of all or part of a client's business if the benefits of an ESOP structure are not applicable for one reason or another. Let me give you a little bit of background on our firm, then I'll turn the microphone over to Alex Mounts for the substance of this webinar. Honigman was started in 1948 by two of the name partners, Jason Honigman and Jack Miller. Today, Honigman is a leading business law firm serving clients locally, nationally, and internationally from its Midwest base primarily in Michigan and Chicago. We counsel clients on complex legal issues in more than 60 areas of legal practice. We pride ourselves on understanding our clients' business and being exceptionally responsive to their business goals and needs. Our transaction practice includes extensive experience handling a wide variety of corporate transactions, representing individual business owners among others. We can provide a comprehensive array of services for all phases of a business transaction. Our clients value our ability to work pragmatically and cost-effectively. Roger Cook and the other lawyers in our tax practice group assist our clients in achieving their goals through the development and implementation of creative and practical tax strategies that address the challenges of a complex and quickly evolving regulatory environment. We have found that our ESOP transaction practice fits well with our goal of providing creative and practical tax strategies that provide meaningful benefits to our clients. With that, I would like to turn the microphone over to Alex Mounts, 
who is the chair of the Employee Benefits Practice Group at the law firm of Craig DeVault and our main speaker today. Thanks, Ron. I uh, appreciate the introduction. Uh, yeah, as, as Ron said, I'm with uh, I'm a partner in the law firm of Craig DeVault and I head up our employee benefits practice. And in particular, uh, we have a, a, a group of uh, ESOP attorneys at Craig DeVault. There are seven of us that do ESOP work on a full time basis. So I'm, I'm first and foremost an ESOP attorney, and, and we work with over 150 uh, ESOP companies around the country, from coast to coast, north to south. Um, on ongoing ESOP matters and spend significant amount of our time uh, with those clients on uh, evaluating whether an ESOP makes sense uh, or not. And, and that's really what we're going to be focusing on today. So we, you know, we've got clients in 33 states and um, uh, really like this stuff. Uh, it's, it's a fun area of practice and uh, really has um, uh, it really has the uh, potential to change people's lives, and, and that's that's one thing that we just all resonate with here at Craig Devault, the ability for uh, to provide a succession planning tool that we'll get into that uh, can not only meet corporate and seller's objectives, but also transition ownership to employees and it'll let them potentially accumulate wealth in a way that they never otherwise would be able to. It, it, it's a uh, it, it seems like a too good to be true type thing, and, and we hear that quite a bit. And uh, we'll we'll kind of touch on that throughout the presentation today. But you know, the the, the first uh, chart that we have is a it's a smattering of words that you'll see kind of all over the screen. And so um, I, I think Xander touched on kind of the Alliance Partners Group uh, slide, the vision and mission, and and then also. You know what makes them different is some of their proprietary modeling that they do, um, and focus on sub S uh, ESOPs. And, and Xander kind of touched on that. Uh, but you know, as we get into the heart of the presentation, you know, you, you probably in the on the this uh, slide that's going to be coming up here, it shows a lot of different words. Um, and you know, as we meet with clients who are exploring an, e an ESOP and thinking about uh, you know, what are they trying to accomplish? You know, succession planning comes out loud and clear. I mean, the, the, there's no shortage of baby boomers right now who are considering how are we going to, how am I going to turn over, you know, my business or our business? And it's, it's kind of the pig in the python type phenomena where they're, they're looking at it and, you know, their advisors maybe are telling them just a, a you know a few different uh, alternatives. They may be saying, well, you know, you can sell to a financial buyer, uh, and and maybe private equity is not attractive to them for whatever reason. Or you could sell to a strategic buyer, and maybe that's not attractive. You know, maybe they don't have kids who are wanting to take over the business or management that it really has the financial wherewithal to uh, to to make it work. And so they're they're just thinking, is there anything else out there? And and an ESOP is another option. It's not um, it's not the best fit for every every situation, and, and certainly there's several situations when an ESOP would not be a good fit at all. Uh, but it, for the right situation, uh, it, it can be a very powerful tool to help meet both corporate objectives and sellers' objectives, and also provide a meaningful benefit to employees to help incentivize them, retain them, motivate them, uh, attract new employees. And so that, that's really, you know, some of the things that um, that they're looking at. So if we, you know, are, are looking at selling to a financial buyer, you know, the um, the motivational is, is usually transactional. So they're, they're trying to, uh, the they're likely going to give, you know, all cash up front. There could be some earnout component. But in general, you know, a financial buyer, private equity, is really looking to get a return on their investment. So they're going to come in, look for ways to find efficiencies, uh, that, uh, and then within, you know, a three, five-year period, look at, you know, selling to monetize on their investment. And, and culturally, that can have very negative impl implications on your employee group uh, and what they, uh, you know, just – and these are a lot of times are employees who have, you know, put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to help get the business what it is. And so, you know, it's just not appealing to some sellers uh, that a, a private equity or other financial buyer come in. It's just it's just not very employer friendly. 
if they're looking at selling to a strategic buyer, you know, the buyer is looking for economies to scale. Um, and, you know, it's a way to eliminate a competitor. Uh, but, you know, through that, there's going to be consolidation of back office and other, you know, sales marketing operation. Um, and, you know, the, the price for a strategic buyer, you know, they could pay below market price. Um, the owners typically exit. And, and it's also not necessarily, uh, you know, employee friendly. They're going to be look, looking to see where there's overlap and, and that way they can obtain efficiencies. And so, you know, that's, a, that's just another thing that, uh, uh, you know, a strategic sell, sale uh, doesn't bring. So if, if it's not broken, you know, don't try to fix it is, uh, you know, one, one thing that uh, companies who are looking at and they're saying, well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to sell to a financial or a strategic buyer. Uh, you know, I worked really hard. All these people really worked hard to build this business what it is, and they really think of it as a legacy. Uh, their name may be on the building, and you know they are certainly have a reputation within the community. And if if they were to sell to a strategic or financial buyer, candidly, they they don't like what that would do uh, uh, to the employees and what that could do to their reputation in the community. And uh, and so you know a lot of them are worried about you know their own legacy, um, and. It, it's going to result in a you know loss of control and significant changes to the business, and so owners are really seeking solutions to provide liquidity, allow the owners to kind of stay in control of the business from the standpoint control of you know running the business, making business decisions um, for as long as as they want, but also provide a mechanism to kind of transition uh, to the next generation of family ownership. And so, you know, in, in comes the the ESOP. And how can it meet those objectives? Um, so to give you a sense, across the country, and this is based off of the most recent uh, data from filings with the Department of Labor, uh, it, there are about 6,900 ESOPs, and, and there's actually some more plans that function similarly to an ESOP. Um, and an ESOP is a retirement plan. It, is a, it stands for Employee Stock Ownership Plan, and it's a type of tax-qualified retirement plan like a 401k plan. And it's subject to many of the same rules, and uh, it, it covers right now about 13.8 million employees, and it has you know, 232 billion dollars in company stock. Uh, there are, you know, ESOP uh, companies in in every state uh, uh, around the around the country. And you know, the thing that an ESOP uh, gives to uh, to a company is it, it's a it's an alternative to selling to an outsider. It uh, it has a gradual uh, a seller can gradually sell stock to an ESOP, or they could sell all the stock at, at once to uh, to uh, the the ESOP. Uh, and it also has tax benefits. So whenever Congress uh, was looking at uh, adopting uh, ESOPs, they, they saw it as an opportunity to do a couple things. One, uh, there was an economist named Louis Kelso, uh, and there's a Senator Long out of Louisiana realized that if we can get in, in ownership into employees' hands, it helps with job retention, and it helps with benefit levels, and it helps with performance. And they, they realized that, and, and so Congress saw that there was this opportunity to uh, endorse it in the code by allowing for uh, certain tax benefits. Certainly the sub S, 100% uh, uh, owned sub S ESOP uh, has the most powerful tax benefit. You know, S corporations don't pay uh, federal income tax at the corporate level, it's a pass through entity and those taxes go down to the shareholders. Well, the, the, an ESOP is a tax exempt trust and, and so it, it doesn't pay any income tax. So if the ESOP owns 100% of the stock, then uh, the basically the income that is generated by that corporation, it, uh, there's no tax at it. There's no tax at the corporate level, and it has a tax-exempt shareholder. So it, it provides this very powerful benefit, uh, whereas you may have 40% of the earnings that are, are going to be taxed. Uh, at the shareholder level, and so the company's making tax distributions to the shareholders so they can pay their taxes. Uh, 
you, you are going to now be able to retain all of that cash uh, within the company that can be used for a lot of different things. And so if you think of two different um, uh, two different uh, uh, scenarios, and if, if we want to go back a couple slides here, um, just on the ESOP landscape, uh, uh, two different companies side by side, one has an ESOP and one that, that does not, uh, just the tax benefit alone very often will actually pay for the transaction to, to do the ESOP. You know, if you're looking at a recapitalization where the company's redeeming, you know, a shareholder stock over time, that's done in a very tax inefficient manner. But with an ESOP transaction, they're actually going to be paying back the seller with tax exempt dollars. And, and our experience is that uh, the tax savings alone will help to repay off the uh, selling shareholders. And so it's a very tax advantage uh, way of, of doing this type of transaction. Uh, again, you know, employees will become participants in the ESOP. So over time, they will get shares allocated to their accounts uh, over time. And as that builds up, then they will uh, own more and more uh, uh, shares in their account, and become beneficial shareholders. And we'll talk a little bit uh, about that later. So if we look at the, um, uh, if we would go back one slide, just improve, improve performance post ESOP. You know, there, there's been a number of studies that have been commissioned. The Nat, there's a, a nonprofit organization, the National Center for Employee Ownership. You, you'll see they're footnoted there. Uh, but not just the National Center for Employee Ownership. Uh, University of Pennsylvania has commissioned some studies on ESOPs, and there's uh, several other economists who have done. Uh, Alex Brill, who is a an economist who did work uh, under the Obama administration. Uh, they've done studies on employee ownership, and what they find is ESOP-owned companies consistently outperform their their peer group uh, uh, greater than two to three percent per year. And, and a lot of that is the employee ownership culture that an ESOP can uh, help create uh, or facilitate uh, or support if it already exists. It's getting employees to transition their mindset from I punch in and I punch out and I'm just here for a paycheck and I don't really care what's going on. I just, you know, just want to punch in and punch out to, hey, what I do here actually matters. That, you know, to the extent I can find ways to creatively save money for the company or generate additional revenue for the money for the money for the company, that that increases the profitability of the company, which then increases the stock value. And that means my retirement account goes up. So you're connecting their head with their pocketbook that what I do actually does make a difference. Not as only am I getting, you know, getting my, my salary paycheck, you know, but, but what I do actually matters. And, you know, what the people around me do matter as well. And, and it's that con version of an employee to an ownership type mentality uh, that is really an intangible benefit that companies uh, with ESOPs can obtain. It, it takes a lot of work and communication and effort, but looking at our clients who do that, it is incredible at the benefits that having an ESOP does. It does create the pride of an ownership culture. It gives them the extra incentive to perform, increase commitment and enthusiasm. Um, ESOP companies have lower turnover, and typically they have higher benefit levels that they're receiving. Um, it also has a material increase in the value of the corporation, showing uh, for an ESOP company versus a similarly situated non-ESOP company. Um, and it allows them to compete favorably against companies that are in uh, industries that are subject to tax. And I was, that's what I was talking about, where you have a, you know, a sub-S ESOP that owns 100% of the stock versus a company that's having to pay out. 40% of its you know, net income to its shareholders so they can pay taxes. There's just a lot more cash there inside the company to do things like capital expenditures to make them really more, uh, more attractive to potential buyers. So kind of going to the next slide on just some national ESOPs you know, because 
some of this can sound like, well, that sounds great, but and you, I know you said there's 6,900 of them, but you know, who are some of these people? You know, have I even heard of them? And a lot of them are are household names. You know, if, if, if public supermarket chain. It's one of the largest ESOPs. It's in the southeastern part of the country. If you ever go to a vacation and that's that part of the country, you've probably been in a Publix, and they're pretty friendly there. Uh, you know, I, I've uh, gone in some Publix uh, supermarkets and you know, ask them, you know, do they know if they had, did you know if you have an ESOP? And, and to a T, every single one of them know about it and what it means to them. And it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you know, Eileen Fisher, UPS, uh, Life Touch, King Arthur Flower. Um, there's several craft breweries that uh, over the past several years, depending on what part of the country that you're in, there's probably a beer that you could get at your supermarket that is uh, owned by an ESOP, uh, New Belgium, uh, Fat Tire Beer. That's probably the, one of the more famous ones. Or, you know, if you're gluten free and and uh, you know Bob's Red Mill makes flour, gluten free flour, or Cliff Bars. You know, these these are all companies that are big companies that you wouldn't necessarily know that they have uh, ESOP, but but they do. And th these are just the, the big names. You, you could go into any state and list out. Uh, pull out names in that state, and there's going to be companies that people are familiar with. Um, they they would say, I had no idea. Uh, and, and it's uh, kind of fun to see the reaction whenever you, you let them know, oh, you're in this state. Well, you know, do you know these companies are in ESOP? No, I had no idea. So th it, it's not a, uh, you know, an abnormal thing. There's a lot of respectable companies that, that, uh, that go the way of, of selling to an ESOP. So going kind of the next slide, you know, subchapter S corporations haven't always been able to uh, sponsor uh, uh, an ESOP. It, it just the Congress before that time was, I, I think, a little concerned that there was, you know, from the taxation side, how do we do it? And so Creek Devault actually worked with the first company, it was Liberty Check Printers, out of uh, Minnesota. And uh, the owner said, you know what, by golly, I want to have an ESOP and I'm an S Corp and that shouldn't stop me. So we worked uh, at Creek Devault, we worked with uh, Congress and worked with uh, you know, other parties to help uh, get legislation passed to allow S Corps to sponsor ESOPs. It's, uh, it, you know, it, it's, it was, uh, a phenomenal thing and in the early days post 1998 there weren't that many uh, ESOPs that were sponsored by S corporations it was a very small minority but I would say in the past since 1998 uh, that that pendulum has swung far the other way that I would say 99% of all new ESOPs are done by S corporations or they're done by C corporations that immediately convert to S corporation status you know right after the the transaction happens um, and the reason for that, as I mentioned, is that if an S Corp sells 100% of its shares to the sub, uh, the S ESOP, then the ESOP's tax exempt. And so that allows for substantial tax savings to pay off the share, shareholder note, provide additional cash flow to the company. Um, and then those shares are, are held in trust for the benefit of employees. They are, they're beneficial shareholders. The, the ESOP is the legal record shareholder. So there's only, yeah, S corporations can only have 100 shareholders. Uh, it doesn't matter if your ESOP has 7,000 participants, as a couple of our clients do, or if they have, you know, 25 participants. Um, it still only counts as, as one shareholder. Uh, so since 1998, it, the trend has definitely been that uh, people see the tax benefits uh, of that. And, uh, and and that's why they kind of go that way. So, um, you know, moving on to the next slide, some of the unique tax aspects of a of a S ESOP is you know contributions to the ESOP are tax deductible. So this is just like you know companies that have a 401k plan that make a matching contribution uh, or a profit sharing contribution. Those are uh, those are tax deductible up to a, a certain you know up to 25% of your your payroll, and the, the ESOP contributions are, are no different. And so the company is going to get a, a tax deduction for that. Uh, the ESOP shares of any tax dividends or distributions can be used to repay a loan. 
and, and a lot of this comes in handy if you're if you're not a if and certainly you can be a an, an SE shop and not own 100 percent of the, the stock. And we have a, a number of clients that that are like that, and some of them will take a gradual approach of getting to 100%. Uh, some of them will go from zero to 100% all at, all at once. Um, and, and so, you know, to the extent that um, the ESOP owns less than 100% of the stock, you know, and the company has, you know, income, then it's going to pay a, a dividend or a distribution to its shareholders so they can pay their taxes. Well, the ESOP has to receive its proportionate share. And so if the company is paying it, distribution or dividend, the, the ESOP has to get its share of that. And, and the ESOP can use that to uh, repay the loan. Um, it can use it to satisfy repurchase liability. And that's just a fancy way of saying, hey, when people uh, retire or they die or they become disabled, they're entitled to get, entitled to get paid for their benefit uh, under the ESOP. It's a fancy way of saying, look, you can use those distributions that go into the, the ESOP to pay their benefit when people are leaving. So it's another source of money that the company doesn't have to put more money into the ESOP to pay people their benefits. You can use those distributions you're already paying because the ESOP doesn't have to pay Uncle Sam uh, the money it gets because it's tax exempt. So that's, that can be very powerful or it can even be used to pay, uh, the, the ESOP can you use it to pay its own expenses. Now the, the Department of Labor has certain rules on how you can do that and what you can pay and what you can't pay, but you know, a trustee fee, a valuation of the stock fee, um, you know, uh, record keeping fees, those can be paid uh, using these, you know, any distributions that, that go into the plan and which, which allows for, you know, more money to be retained in, in the company. And, and you know, the, the, la the last part that we'll touch on is, uh, you know, when someone does get paid their benefit, so if I retired and I got paid my benefit, uh, just like a 401k plan, I can take that money and I can roll it into an IRA or another eligible retirement plan to continue the tax deferral. And so I don't pay taxes down immediately whenever I get that benefit. It'll, it, it, at some point, as I take the money out, um, I'll have to pay taxes on it uh, at ordinary rates. Uh, but I'm allowed to continue that tax deferral into the future whenever I'm, I'm likely going to be at a lower tax bracket. And so, you know, you have that benefit uh, of a, an ESOP as well. Um, so kind of going to the, the next slide of, you know, 10 benefits for sub S ESOPs. You know, these are things that, uh, that we've just found going through uh, working with clients that, uh, that, that kind of come up again and again and again that are really beneficial or things that people highlight as being important to them. One, you know, it can allow for faster growth, higher profits, higher employee morale, you know, retention and recruiting. And, and I say that it can allow for those things. You know, the, the ESOP is not some, you know, panacea. It's not the magic bullet that's going to cure everything. Management still has to show up every day. They have to keep their eyes on the ball. They still have to work hard. The company still has to be intentional and strategic and still has to run its business. The, the ESOP is, it's a tax uh, qualified retirement plan. It, it is it is really no more than that, but it does allow the company to uh, have this incentive uh, and create this type of culture that helps to facilitate those things. And certainly, the tax benefits help as well. So, just having it an ESOP isn't going to create employee morale, but intentionally communicating about the ESOP and seeing how that can assist will help help create higher employee morale. A great example of this, one of our clients uh, is in the RV industry in, in Elkhart, Indiana, which was kind of the epicenter during the recession of, you know, the bottom of the barrel. I, I think, you know, President, uh, President Obama uh, flew in and it was just, you know, it was like 80% unemployment because, you know, what aren't people buying during recession? Well, they're not buying RVs. And so one of our clients provided services to the RV industry um, in the form of, you know, cutting, cutting and treating cloth and leather and those types of things. And, and they were owned by an ESOP. And management said, hey, look, the, you know, here's where we are. You know, we don't want to lay anybody off if we can help it, but we have to find ways to survive here. 
And people knew not only was it their job, but they also knew from their retirement account standpoint, hey, look, we're owners of this company through the ESOP. And they started getting creative. And hey, we don't have to send those floor mats out to be cleaned. We'll clean them ourselves. And what if we start cutting things this way, we have less scrap. And so we have less inventory. And they started doing those things. And they had to they off they had to lay off a few people, but on the whole, they came out of they survived this recession and their stock price has roared back and, and really had they not had an ESOP, that really wouldn't have happened. So that's just, you know, a simple type example of how it can create, you know, the growth and profits and morale. Um, you know, the corporation can obtain 100% deductibility of principal and interest uh, uh, on, on an ESOP when they're, they're making their payments on the loan. That can be important. Um, it can have increased cash flow due to deductibility of the principal on an ESOP loan. Uh, corporations engaging in ESOP transactions uh, can offer, often uh, obtain preferred terms on loans. There's a number of states that actually have uh, ESOP programs uh, that are sponsored by the state that uh, actually give them preferential terms for doing an ESOP because the states know that you know creating employee ownerships keeps jobs in the state. It can help produce higher wages, and all of that goes to help support a tax base. And so there's some states that actually have, you know, preferential terms on loans. Um, its ability to give employees equity in the company w without them having to pay, uh, and it's on a tax-deductible basis to corporations. And, and so, you know, a lot of times there's people that would love to be owners of the company, and here's a chance for them to be able to do it. And really the way they do it is kind of it's their sweat equity. It's by showing up every day. It's by working, doing their job. And, and that allows them to uh, then get uh, uh, stock in their retirement plan account. Uh, corporation can refinance existing debt on a tax deductible basis. Uh, you know, just really looking at uh, how they can finance that. They can purchase capital goods using pre-tax dollars, uh, especially because here you've got a hundred uh, in a sub S hundred percent scenario. It's not paying any income tax, and so it's it's allowing more money for the purchase of goods or even acquisitions. We have a client right now that's a 100% sub S ESOP and its repayment period of doing an acquisition is two years shorter than if it didn't have an ESOP. And so it just gives them leverage that way. Um, they can, uh, corporation can increase its net worth and value by rolling over existing qualified plans into an ESOP. So you can uh, allow participants to roll 401k money into or other IRA money into an ESOP, and, and then the ESOP can use that to buy stock from shareholders. It's a way to help finance the transaction and allows them to get even more equity, and it can be a source of capital for a transaction. Uh, it can pr provide the ability to attract and retain top talent. And, and we see this a lot of times in, sometimes in smaller, uh, in, uh, in communities where there's, you know, a major, uh, a major corporation in town, and, and you just have a hard time competing with them on pay and benefits. You know, it's the, it's something that differentiates you. That you know, they're not going to have the chance of getting equity with this other employer, and so, you know, maybe the benefits aren't identical up front on maybe just the salary, but the retirement benefits are so much better with the ESOP company, uh, and so that's a way. And, and then it's also significantly impacting people's lives in a positive way. I mean, it, it um, not every uh, ESOP is this glaring success story where every participant becomes wealthy, but it has, if the company keeps its eye on the ball and performs and continues to, you know, advance the company forward, it has the chance. Uh, in, in my, in our experience, a very good chance of really transferring that wealth to employees in a way they otherwise wouldn't have been able to accumulate on, on their own. Uh, and, and a great example right now, I'm working on a, a sale transaction where I think they're, uh, uh, the, the company is going to, uh, it's going through a, a sale. It's 100% at sub S ESOP. And when the sale is complete, I think there are going to be 76 millionaires. That are participants um, because of 
uh, this transaction. And this is in a rural community, and uh, there is no chance that any of these uh, individuals, without them having to put in a dollar of their own money, would ever have been able to accumulate this much wealth on their own. I mean, it, it has a generational impact. You can be thinking about there's kids that are going to college who never would have gone to college. Um, you know, there's going to be homes paid off. Sure, there's probably going to be some, you know, new bass boats and dually trucks in the in the area for certain, but it, it definitely has the ability to impact a family for, for generations. Uh, and that's just a really, really neat thing. So kind of going to the next slide, um, you know, it's ownership of uh, the employer security. Now, it's not a legal record shareholder ownership. It's a beneficial ownership. And that's important because some people think, oh, gosh, if my employees own the stock, then, you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to want to do, you know, to see all the financial information and really get involved in, in everything. And that's really not the case. I mean, they're not entitled to really any information. You can certainly share as much as you want. There's a number of ESOP companies that will do that, um, share financial information so that people feel an even more empowered to understand. But you, you're certain they're not going to be involved in being on the board uh, or having a right at, say, on compensation or anything like that. It doesn't require any payment. Um, when the ESOP incurs a loan to buy the stock, it's non-recourse to the employees. Um, it's a retirement plan that directly correlates with the performance. So if the company performs well and the stock value goes up, so their retirement account goes up. If the company performs poorly and the stock value goes down, the uh, same goes with the retirement plan. Um, there's a unique put option required by law. So when, when people are leaving, in my example, I retire, you know, the company has to buy my stock back and, and pay me cash. And so, um, you know, that's a, it's a requirement that I'm going to get liquidity for that. Um, you know, if somebody sells to an ESOP, you don't have the fear of job loss like you do. Uh, I'm working with a company in Georgia right now that is putting an ESOP and they explored private equity. They decided not to because all their employees were going to probably get cut. And, and that created a lot of instability. But now they're putting in an ESOP, and employees are excited about it, and they know that there's stability with their job. Um, and so it, it really helps, which that helps to kind of increase the morale. Um, and, um, uh, you know, really it's, uh, it, it creates that market for their stock. I kind of talked about that a little bit above with the unique put option. So, you know, how does the transaction flow? Um, you know, so the alliance model for determining eligibility, it's kind of like, so how will this work for me and my family? I mean, any seller that's thinking about this, ultimately it's like, okay, what are, you know, what are my objectives? What am I trying to accomplish? And, um, you know, how is this going to work for me? How's it going to work for my family and planning out? What about the corporation? And, and so, you know, first you're, you're really thinking about the value and, um, really uh, thinking through how much could this, you know, company be worth. And in and, and the ESOP world, they, they go off of a fair market value determination. Uh, the trustee of the ESOP is the entity that's going to buy the stock, and they have to have an independent appraiser. It's a requirement of the Internal Revenue Code, NERISA. Those are the kind of two bodies of law that govern ESOPs. And they're they're looking at um, a fair market value standard, not necessarily maybe a multiple of book. And so they're going to have an independent appraisal firm that's you know experienced and qualified doing ESOP valuations because there are a little bit some differences for ESOP valuations. And, and they're going to look at a couple different methodologies, um, and they're going to determine what are those appropriate methodologies. Um, and you know some of them may be looking at similarly situated public companies um, or what uh, sale data is available uh, in the market um, or looking at your uh, looking at kind of an income approach where they're looking at discounted future cash flows um, to looking at those things to figure out what's the right model and it'll probably be more on the income approach and they're going to weight those those models and they're going to use publicly available information regarding non-publicly traded companies, looking at their financial performance and merger activity. They're going to 
you know, look at the, you know, the effect of cash and stock dividends on value and repurchase obligation of value. And all of that's going to get thrown in the hopper. And, and ultimately, they're going to kind of determine uh, a fair market value. And that's, that's really kind of what the ESOP, ESOP can't pay more than that. If it paid more than that, it would be uh, it'd be a prohibited transaction, uh, which is which is a bad thing. Uh, you, you don't want a prohibited transaction to occur. And so, you know, looking at the a typical transition, you know, on the on the next slide, uh, you know, the the company gets modeled with Alliance Partners Group. Um, they, they look at eligibility. So, you know, kind of the first step hold, step uh, threshold is. You know, this big picture. Does, do I think this could make sense for for my business? And um, you know, as they as they do that, they are um, you know going to kind of work through a, a questionnaire um, to to do that. And then Alliance is going to, if the answer is kind of going forward, then Alliance is going to present some options for the most beneficial you know SESOP structure for the company. You know, looking at the total percentage of planned uh, ownership, and then also you know, synthetic equity for the planned beneficiaries. And, and synthetic equity can be, you know, it can look at incentive plans going forward, um, you know, for management running it, and, or it could look at, you know, different financing terms that, uh, that the sellers are going to receive in connection with the sale. So, you know, maybe they want some upside and, and there could be something uh, called a warrant that, that's used. Um, you know, then the company is going to get appraised using those valuation methods that we talked about, an independent firm specialized in the ESOP. And, and once you see that there's viability there for that, uh, then, they, then they'd be looking at completing an engagement agreement to begin the company succession plan. So that's kind of step one. And then, you know, step two, you know, the transaction, uh, you know, it kind of a typical transaction, uh, and you can have some differences, is looking at, you know, the company redeeming all of the owner's shares in exchange for cash and a promissory note, you know, equal to the value of the company. And, uh, you know, there are different financing terms on that promissory note. The owner is probably going to receive some of that consideration up front, um, it, you know, if, if there's bank financing, and it's pretty common for the, there to be bank financing so that the sellers can get some cash up front. And this would be a difference between, you know, selling to an ESOP versus selling to, you know, a private equity firm that may be getting you all cash up front. Um, you know, the remainder of the the sale to an ESOP, though, is going to be in the form of installment promissory note. It's going to have arm's length, you know, market interest rate. Um, uh, but again, you know, banks are willing to lend into the transaction uh, because they they see uh, you know just the power of the the tax deferral uh, you know benefit uh, in what that does to the company's higher cash flows as a result of paying no tax. Um, you know, the owners are going to be taxable in the gain of their sale, uh, the sale, you know, of shares only if they receive, you know, payments. And so, um, you know, if they, you know, get cash up front, you're going to have a capital gain component. And then, uh, you know, as you get payments on your note, then you'll, you'll get uh, the, you know, capital gain on those return of the principal over the period of the note and interest is taxed at ordinary income rates. Um, you know, then the company, you know, immediately following the redemption, it's kind of simultaneous, immediately following the redemption, then the, the company is going to sell, you know, newly issued shares to the ESOP. Um, and that's, you know, it's kind of a to be determined amount. The ESOP's going to own 100%. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say exactly how many shares the ESOP would buy um, in exchange for uh, a promissory note that's going to have, you know, an arm's length interest rate. It's pretty common to use the AFR long term rate. And so, you know, in, in, in this instance, the, the ESOP's basically going to borrow money from the company, and it's called an exempt loan, and then it's going to buy newly issued shares um, as part of that. And so that's, that's kind of the big picture structure. It's not super complicated. You have the company adopting an ESOP. You have the company redeeming the outstanding shares from the shareholders, and then the company selling newly issued shares to the ESOP. You know, the, the last point is synthetic equity strategies can be deployed, and this is referring to, you know, to get to a certain rate of return, the company can use warrants on the seller note, uh, 
to uh, especially if the company thinks that there's upside there um, as the and the warrant uh, operates as like an appreciation vehicle so the more the company stock appreciates the more value the warrant has and so uh, that's an option and then also you know you can have you know if the owners are going to continue to stay in it and work they could be receiving some kind of synthetic equity like a stock appreciation right that would be compensation income them to to try to in, induce them to grow the stock value you know after the transaction so the you know the result uh, as you'll you'll see in this next slide the company now has a single shareholder it's the SESOP trust you know the owners obtain liquidity in the form of cash and notes the company continues to be managed by the board of directors and potentially some of the you know current management so the sellers can continue to be on the board of directors um, you know the trustee may want some an, an independent director there uh, but they could get comfortable with the current board of directors um, you know the east the company's now it's not subject to federal state income tax uh, even after the debts repaid a slight nuance california does have a franchise tax on uh, as corporations that apply to ESOPs, but it's a very small tax amount. Uh, but otherwise, it, that is a, tr a completely true statement. Um, the S ESOP structure permits the company to hold and accumulate cash uh, uh, free of tax. You know, synthetic equity like SARS, stock appreciation rights, or warrants can be uh, issued to key employees. Um, the ESOP permits a smooth transition strategy, gives employees a meaningful stake in the company, and, and employees are now incentivized to stay and work with an owner's mentality as they benefit directly from the, the company's success. So just kind of looking at, um, kind of going into just a, a few examples, and we're not going to get into the weeds on this because I think we wanted to, you know, open it up for some questions here. But just a, you know, just some a uh, few basic assumptions, a spreadsheet example, and some graphs. So you know, looking at some of these assumptions, you've got. Um, and, and you can go back through these, you know, after the, the presentation, but looking at, you know, the valuation and the equity and, you know, the total enterprise value and, and, and then you've got some of the net revenue and total employees um, and so on and so forth, kind of working their way through. Uh, and, and then going to the, the next slide, you know, the owner's value proposition example, um, you know, this this is showing kind of interest and principal and cash received and cumulative cash and synthetic value, how that can model out over over a seven year period. So you can see that there is uh, significant um, uh, significant benefits to a seller in this type of transaction. And I, and I think these next two graphs kind of demonstrate that, just the, looking at the, the business impact of you know, total capital, total value showing, you know, the ESOP's performance versus not having an, an ESOP. Um, and then also on the, the next slide, the, the business impact of, you know, cost of uh, an ESOP uh, versus the cumulative total savings. It, it, it's, it's very, very powerful. So um, kind of the, the last common concerns, questions, that people have um, can management stay in place well yes the management team is going to continue to stay in place as long as as they'd like you know uh, uh, subject to approval of the trustee and the board and, and really you know the board's going to you know drive that home um, will employees take over control of business no i touched on that they're not direct shareholders uh, you know management and the and the board are really the ones that that's driving it you know and then why would uh, congress create this that reduces taxes and and it's really just it's kind of like pushing on a balloon you push in one area and it goes out another side so it's not that there's less taxes it's the time when the taxes are going to be collected because eventually people are going to pay taxes on the distribution of benefits but they also allow it because of just the benefit of the job retention growth uh higher benefits pays is important and then the the last two uh points are that um, you know is there a prospect to getting some cash up front? Yes, you know typically banks are willing to take you know uh, take off some of the seller note, um, provide cash, and that could be at 30 to 40 percent of the equity valuation. Some of that obviously depends on your borrowing capacity and where you are from a debt standpoint. And then um, you know is there a mechanism that allows uh, uh, 
that enables current owners management to participate in the value creation going forward. So yeah, I, I talked about um, stock appreciation rights or warrants um, are things that can you know allow that uh, that uh, the growth and the value of the stock where a seller or employee could um, uh, benefit from that. So, you know, the the last slide is just, you know, the disclaimer that, you know, pesky attorneys uh, like me have to put on uh, about being for educational purposes. Um, but really, I think the team now, you know, the Alliance Partners Group really just, and Ron and, and myself really just want to pause now and see if, if people have questions. We, we know it's a lot of information in, in, in a short amount of time to to digest uh but we thought it was very important that you know uh that we continue to bring this to market because it's, it's such a powerful tool for succession planning going back to the you know the word scattering of you know what keeps coming up the most is succession planning and it, it's a very powerful tool for the right scenario that that can work for companies to transition ownership uh in a way that allows them to maintain their legacy uh, and reward their employees who have worked hard and help to, you know, create and facilitate that employee ownership culture and, you know, keeping those jobs there. So uh, with, with that, I will, uh, you know, I, I will pause and, uh, you know, open it up for, for questions. Um, uh, and and uh, Nick, I don't know if there's anything else uh, instruction wise that, that you need to, to give the uh, yeah. participants. Not not so much. I, I greatly appreciate uh, the presentation. We do have a couple of questions. Um, we will be sending out a replay uh, of this presentation today. Uh, in addition, we can send the slides for anybody who, who wishes to see those as well. Um, so, Alex, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, what is the minimum size company that you work with? Yeah, so we, we um, have clients that are – um a transaction size where it, it's you know everything from a you know a million and a half dollar transaction uh is you know probably on the small side it, it's probably looking at you know things you're considering as you're evaluating this is a big part of it is payroll um and can the payroll support this uh and the number of employees also comes into play with some irs rules and so you know probably fewer than 20 employees is is pretty it's pretty hard to make the testing work uh it, it's theoretically possible but it, it can get to be a challenge so you're probably looking at a payroll of probably you know around a million dollars uh, or more on the low side, probably 20 employees uh, or more on the low side is, are, are probably some guidelines for people to consider. Right. Is it possible to do a partial uh, SESOP? Absolutely, it's possible. So we, we probably have about 30 of our clients that are partial SESOPs. And, um, you know, there are definitely reasons why, um, uh, why some companies want uh, an owner wants to maybe maintain control and from an ownership perspective, but they want to take some chips off the table and also reward employees. And so uh, a partial ESOP can sub S ESOP can can make a lot of sense um, in that instance. Is there a minimum percentage that's uh, required in that particular scenario? There, there's not. So we have clients that are everywhere from probably four percent. Uh, uh, sub S ESOP on up to 100%. So there's not a, a minimum threshold of ownership. Does this uh, does this plan work for an LLC? Um, it's that's a, somewhat of a complicated question. The the easiest answer, and this is kind of the general overall answer, is that um, uh, ESOPs are required to be sponsored by corporations. So it's a, a C corp or an S corp. The, there is a recent private letter ruling where uh, an LLC elected to be taxed as an S corporation and was able to get approval to sponsor an ESOP. And so um, if the facts are right, it is theoretically possible, uh, but it's very fact specific. Uh, let's see here. Are there limitations with family members? Uh, great question. So um, uh, there could be limitations with family members. So there are some testing rules that go along with 
um, the one of the things after 1998 that Congress um, uh, put in place is they were they were worried that people were taking uh, abusive taking abusive structure transaction to get even too much tax deferral, and so there's a code section it's 409P that uh, that really gets into looking at um, who owns the stock in the ESOP and then you know do they have any kind of deferred comp or synthetic equity outside the ESOP and so there are some rules in place that. Uh, if uh, that look at family members ownership and so um, the the point there is our clients that uh, it's not a carte blanche no there's not a problem with having family members in the ESOP but if it looks like there's a problem there are strategies to work around it um, where people where you could still do the ESOP transaction and, and try to make up the benefit uh, a similar benefit to people outside of the ESOP what are some of the main reasons that owners decide against uh, doing an ESOP plan? Yeah, uh, it's uh, uh, complexity. So in, in concept, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty simple to understand in concept, uh, but it, it's a pretty deep rabbit hole. And um, and so I think that that's that's one reason some people say, you know what, I, I and I think it's a hurdle people can get over. And certainly we have a lot of clients that do get over it. Um, uh, but that could be one thing. Um, uh, another thing is maybe they want all their cash immediately. And so they can't get at that with an ESOP. And so that doesn't work. Um, the number of service providers involved. And so you're going to have a trustee and they're going to have a valuation firm um, uh, that, um, you know, those are new people coming in and, uh, you know, maybe they're not used to having a lot of service providers and, um, uh, and, and so that's just a different thing for them. And, and, and so, you know, there's additional cost to that, um, you know, having, selling your business, you know, hiring a broker and selling your business is more expensive than doing an ASOP, but, you know, there's an ongoing cost to it as well. And so that, that could be a reason, um, you know, all of these things are, there, there are ways to work around them, but there, there, these are some reasons that people say, no, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have time for one more question. So we'll, we'll, do this question here around pricing. So what is the cost of implementing and uh, is it a percentage of the business valuation and, and do you charge hourly, flat, fee, uh, et cetera? Yeah, so maybe I'll let Xander kind of touch on from, you know, Alliance Partners Group from kind of from their standpoint, uh, it'd be good for them to, to weigh in, um, you know, initially and then, and then I can comment from there. Yeah, so we do a, a fee, a flat fee, um, based on the on the actual uh, deal, um, and that includes valuation fees, and then actually getting the S corp uh, ESOP put together uh, with our legal partners and our business partners, um, and then uh, it really is a, 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 on an individual basis, and that that fee is paid at the point of liquidation uh, at the liquidation event. So. Um, yeah, that that is a is a flat fee. Okay. Yeah, and then and then you know going forward on the implementation, you know we uh, at Creed Vault we work on a you know an hourly basis. It's not on a you know percentage of the valuation. Um, it's on a it's on an hourly basis uh, for for implementation. Uh, but then there are you know there are other fees. There's a, a trustee involved, and a, the trustee has its own valuation firm involved. Um, if if a bank is involved, then you know you you have banking fees and potential bank counsel fees. So there there are other potential fees as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be we'll be redistributing the the slides uh, and this presentation as well for everybody on the call. Um, you'll get that within the next day or two, um, and you'll also get to the contact information for our presenters on the call today. And I just want to thank everybody who who presented today on the call, uh, great information. We always love having uh, guests present, especially on topics of interest of our, our community and our audience. And thanks to everyone who joined us today on the call. Um, we appreciate you uh, taking the time to spend today with, with the presenters. And uh, on behalf of Succession Link, thanks again. Thank you.